For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting the use of native plants to create sustainable landscapes. We carry out our mission through educational programs and provide resources such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education Grants, and other educational webinars. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters deliver area programs, including garden tours, speakers, conferences, and seed exchanges. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and take advantage of the camaraderie and support that come with being a part of a local chapter. Our critical mission needs you. Wild Ones chapters, our members put mission into action. We get our hands dirty and learn by doing. Chapters are actively recruiting officers and volunteers to plan upcoming events. Chapter activities require the time and talents of many different people to coordinate. Amplify the impact you have on the native plant movement by sharing your skills and enthusiasm with others. Please reach out to your local chapter to find out how you can get involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, now's the time to consider starting a Wild One Seedling chapter. Chapter founders across the country connect and collaborate with one another for mutual support and guidance. If you are eager to advance the mission and cultivate support for native plants in your area, visit the Start a Chapter page on the Wild Ones website. Wild Ones inspires people and communities across the country to transform home landscapes into vibrant and essential habitats for all forms of life. Programs like this would not be possible without generous support from our members, donors, and folks like you attending Wild Ones programs. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today by visiting donate.wildones.org. Thank you for joining us for the Wild Ones Native Garden Design Series. My name is Danielle Bell, and I will be your host for this discussion. I have been a Wild Ones member since 2017, and I am part of the Menominee River Area Chapter in Wisconsin. I'm honored to be talking with our designers, Amy Heilman and Rebecca Marquart, the designers of the Wild Ones Grand Rapids Native Garden Design. Wild Ones Native Garden Designs follows the premise that native plant landscaping can be beautiful, beneficial, achievable for gardeners of all skill sets in terms of scope and budget. This program contains resources that include information on how to get started by identifying your ecoregion, selecting and determining plant placement in your yard, considering how your own specific climate conditions are, and finding local native plant nurseries in your area. The program also features a growing number of free downloadable native garden designs created by professional landscape designers representing various ecoregions in the United States. A plant list accompanies each design and provides a quick preview of the diversity and beauty of the native plants incorporated into the design, as well as a phased installation approach, all of which can be downloaded and printed easily from home. All designs are assembled using native plants that provide habitat and food for wildlife that also offer a colorful and beautiful garden throughout the growing season. We hope you find these resources inspiring and encourage and motivate you on your native garden journey. We are honored to have join us the designers Amy Heilman and Rebecca Marquart here today. Amy Howman is a certified landscape designer and has been planning and implementing sustainable gardens for over 20 years, initially in California, where water restrictions drive most planned landscapes, and currently in her home state of Michigan. Her business, The Living Garden, refers to the ecologic life that can be brought to any garden space with the presence of appropriate native plant species. Amy has worked in various areas of natural resource management, landscape restoration, and native plant nursery operations. She is a frequent educator and speaker, and her goal is to encourage property owners to take an active role in the planning and care of their gardens and to use these spaces to learn about the natural world and the web of life they support. Rebecca Marquart is the owner of Reverie, a landscape architecture design studio with an ecological restoration focus and core values that hold every site within the built landscape as one that has the potential to protect, improve, and regenerate the ecosystem services that may have been displaced over time. 
Rebecca is a licensed landscape architect with over 25 years experience working with native plants and urban environments and is an accredited professional with the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Rebecca's leadership focuses with Reverie in is developing a narrative and design for residential and commercial sites that addresses the important topics of water quality, infiltration, soil health, pollinator services, habitat regeneration, and climate regulation that also carefully considers the human experience within these landscapes. Welcome, Amy and Rebecca. We're excited to have you here to discuss your design for the Grand Rapids region. Hi there. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you for having us. This has been a fun project. All right. So for those of us who are less familiar with the Grand Rapids region, uh, would you please share about the typical weather and climate conditions, including seasons, temperatures, weather patterns that you both experience in your region? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Michigan is a very unique state because we are surrounded by five Great Lakes. And Lake Michigan is the closest lake to Grand Rapids, which is about 75 miles to the west of us. Um, to give you a sense of the proportion of the lake, uh, if you put the states of Maryland, um, Massachusetts, and uh, Delaware together, that's the size of Lake Michigan. So it's a sizable lake, and it's not even our largest Great Lake. We've got two others that are larger than that. So we have a lot of water around us. And this body of water can really moderate the warm and cold air masses that come into to our state. Um, typically, we get winds from the northwest or the west. Um, so whether it's warm air or cold air, the lake affects that. Um, it's also a great source of evaporation. So when that um, when the water is evaporating into the air, that comes onto land as humidity for us, and sometimes as um, as lake effect snow in winter. Uh, the humidity also um, creates some cloud cover. Michigan's known as one of the cloudiest states in the country, at least in the winter. Um, so we have the lake to thank us for that. Uh, but we do have awfully sunny skies in the summer, some part, partly cloudy days, especially the real humid ones. Um, our temperatures range from the upper 70s to maybe the mid 80s in the summer, uh, but we have been seeing an increase in 90 degree days, which is quite unusual, even higher than 90, um, especially in the last couple of years. So uh, that's, a, that's a new one for us. Uh, Rain starts in April and we'll get periodic rain events, maybe through October, uh, different times. Um, but July and August are our driest and warmest months. Um, our rainfall generally runs around a little over three feet a year of rain. Um, the snow typically starts in November and kind of carries us through into maybe March, end of March. Um, however, we are seeing in the last few years that um, snowfall has definitely decreased. Uh, we often don't see snow until almost Christmas now. Um, the temperatures range in the low 30s and um, generally high teens to low 30s and then Rarely do we get um, below zero temperatures, so that's that's nice. Um, again, mostly cloudy skies in the winter and due to that Lake Michigan effect. So very varied, varied weather here in Michigan. Yeah, sounds very similar to what we kind of experience over here in Wisconsin on the other side of, of Lake Michigan. Um, if someone was new to your area, how would you describe what it's like to garden with native plants in your eco-region eco and what factors might you prioritize if you want your garden to thrive? Well, um, in Grand Rapids, we really are influenced by the Grand River, one of the state's largest rivers, and it's a uh, glacial relic. And so with that, we have all kinds of glacial till, sandy soils are quite commonly found. Um, but like any place, um, <clears throat> We always say to our clients and customers, you know, people that we're helping guide, um, is that you really want to study the conditions of your site, um, pay attention 
And then also some places to look for examples of healthy ecological landscapes. You might visit some of the larger regional parks or arboretums where people are practicing good conservation practices and management. Um, so those are a lot of the things that we really talk about as your starting point. And then thinking about what are the solutions to some problems that you may identify. But really when you're thinking kind of big picture, get familiar with the site, the soils that you have, and the conditions of the sun patterns um, and drainage, and then really going for you know, selecting your plant palette based on those things. Yeah, all great advice. I always tell clients too, when I'm talking to them, like, you know, think of it throughout the season. Don't just, you know, if you moved into a new house, give yourself a year so you can kind of experience all the seasons for, for one season before you start planting. That's great, yeah. Okay, so moving on, uh, you kind of already touched about this a little bit, Amy, talking about climate change. So most in the, of us in the U.S. have experienced some degree of climate change. Um, what besides, you know, you already talked about, you know, having some snowfall decreasing and temperatures maybe increasing a little bit. Is there anything else that you have noticed in the past 10, 20 years? Well, uh, I was born in Michigan and I've lived here most of my life. Um, I've experienced the tremendous snows of the 70s. Uh, and I've definitely seen a difference uh, in the severity of our winters being less severe. Uh, warmer temperatures, less snow. Um, weather records show that since the 1900s, our temperatures in Michigan have risen two to three degrees, but it's been only in the last 20 years that we've really seen a sharper increase in, in the uh, temperatures. And so Less severe winters, we're also starting to see uh, bud burst happening maybe up to a week earlier than in past decades. Um, so this influences, especially our orchard growers. We have a lot of orchards on the west side of Michigan, uh, cherry and apple and um, peach. And so the sooner the buds burst, the more susceptible they are to a, a sudden freeze and then loss of crops. And so we've seen that happening periodically. Uh, probably one of the biggest things too is that our lakes, our, our Great Lakes are not covered with ice anymore or, or infrequently. Um, and this allows that open water in the winter to evaporate again, which then falls on the land as precipitation or um, lake effect snow. So um, we'll also get sudden intense rains periodically from maybe May through uh, October, but especially spring and fall. And these intense rains, they'll be quick but intense where they drop a lot of water at one time, um, is causing a lot of sedimentation in our rivers and in our lakes um, and erosion. Uh, we're also seeing a lot more wave action. Uh, I don't know if you a few years ago, we, there was a lot of national news about Lake Michigan's shoreline and the severe erosion that was happening and houses falling into the water. So there was a lot of uh, extensive property damage. So those are some of the things that I've seen in the last 20 years. Yeah, we've had issues with the, the erosion and the bluffs falling and things like that on our side too. So it's just crazy to to see all these changes so quickly. Um, so how can native plants help us? How we, we see these climate changes, most of us probably know there's things that we can do as humans, as consumers, but how can we use native plants to mitigate some of these changes? Well, you'll see in our design that responding to the fluctuating lake levels, we really wanted to show what a riparian planting can look like. That would naturally be the um, community of plants that are at the lake or creek or river's edge that provide this buffer um, and kind of can fluctuate with the temp with the different levels of the lake. Um, these are comprised, and you'll see in the design that we used a lot of sedges, iris, some of the other native shrubs um, like winterberry that can handle some of the kind of wetter conditions, button bush as well. Um, so we wanted to show what those could look like and did so in a way that was somewhat 
aesthetically simple in terms of providing flowers that would bloom at various times of the year, but sort of an uh, a legible design that you could see these layers of shorter vegetation with shrubs and trees, um, variety of blooming plants. But the reason why plants like sedges are extremely valuable for these kinds of plantings is their deep roots, um, but more importantly, their fibrous roots. They, they sort of become like a web under the ground that stabilizes the slope. Um, and to, you know, to limit or you know, not even enable erosion from happening with those changes in the um, levels of the lake. We also really, I think, did um, an example of what you can do by taking advantage of the rains that may come in the spring like we have here um, with utilizing that water that surges out of the downspouts in creating bioswales, and um, which is similar to a rain garden, um, but a lot of different applications of trying to slow down that water using native plants, they will kind of basically enable those the water to try to go into the ground. And that's what we're trying to do more of. Um, in our built landscapes, we really modified what would typically be the water cycle where you have precipitation, infiltration, transpiration of the trees and shrubs and every all the leaves are putting that moisture back into the atmosphere that's getting evaporated. It's condensing up into the clouds and then precipitating again. Our um, built environment has really jeopardized that natural cycle. And so what we are trying to do in many different ways is trying to bring back the vegetation um, and doing so in creative ways, I think you can do. Um, but those plants have all kinds of benefits I think we'll talk about later. Um, also the design we had wanted to emphasize ways to shade and cool down both the house for people's comfort and um, reduction in energy costs and reliance, but also to shade the ground. We're, I think our design really focused on trying to think about the ground level, the soil, and establishing and nurturing, regenerating the kind of the health of the soil. And we did that in different kinds of ways. Lastly, I don't know that um, this is emphasized enough, but Amy and I both have experienced a lot of increase in invasive species. For many different reasons, some of the southern species are, you know, migrating up here. So we have surges of invasives that we didn't yeah. have before. So. Um, because there are invasives out in the in the landscape, virtually everywhere, birds are taking those berries because they don't discriminate what berries they'd like to eat and they're dispersing them elsewhere. So there's lots of things to cover today. And I'm sorry, I just responded to that one question with a lot of different um, answers, but um, I think that's kind of what we responded to the climate change. Yeah, and those are all great topics. You know, water is a huge important thing about our landscapes and something that we really need to cherish, especially, and I think we know that in the Great Lakes region, we know how important our water source is. We're blessed with a, a overabundance of it. Um, and we need to, to protect it and keep it clean and, and filter it um, before it goes into the lakes. So you talked about um, a lot of things on how our native plants build that resiliency in the landscape. So let's go into looking at your design in a little more detail. Um, so we talked about, you know, that ecosystem that can be created within just your property. You know, you don't have to think too big when you think about an ecosystem, you know, our each, the house kind of creates all that stuff. Um, you talked about water conservation and, and that cycle and everything. So going a little bit further, um, do you have any more things to say about like the types of plants that you selected or features that you have in the design that you want to touch on? Absolutely. <laughs> we could both talk all day yeah. if you'd like. But. Yeah. Well, one thing I think we really prioritized in this fictitious clients um, is that they had a goal of adding kind of adding more diversity for the wildlife. Um, that was something that, you know, you always have to think about what are your goals and objectives for your landscape? 
because sometimes that's a really good starting point in terms of what what do you want this to be, and then um, and then also studying what maybe the problems are on your site and think about how might you solve some of those problems while also bearing in mind your goals and objectives. And so one thing I think that we um, wanted to show with this design was the value of native trees and shrubs. And I could stop there, microphone drop, um, because that is one thing that if you have interest in bringing back sort of the kind of the, the natural ecosystem that we had before we started building on this land, you could start with shrubs that are native and really make a huge difference. Um, so really providing food for essentially the food web that we consider the eco, um, ecology. Um, you know, trees and shrubs that are native are some of the very first things to bloom. As most people know by now, as we're really promoting getting those in the landscape, but that's what our early pollinators are looking for. The leaves of these um, kinds of woody plants are also some of the most beneficial to our caterpillars of moths and butterflies, who on one hand are prey to predators like the birds that we call songbirds. Um, they need to feed so many to their young. And then once those um, are kind of back into the landscape, you start seeing this whole beautiful cycle of that food web. Um, and I think we've talked about sedges, but um, yeah, I'm sure Amy has more to add into that. Just kind of, we could go on and on about the benefits of native plants, but I'll give a chance to Amy to speak about that. Well, and, and talking about, um, how we begin our work with clients, I know, and you mentioned this in the beginning, Danielle, um, it's so important to spend some time on your property and get to know it if it's a new property to you. And people are you know, eager to get that garden in right away. But I really, if you can spend a year seeing what's happening in each season, seeing where your shade is, seeing if you have low areas that's collecting water, um, try to ID your invasive species. Um, Maybe you'll be lucky and not have any, but uh, that's not too common around here. It's usually the first thing I do when I go to a property is I point out their invasive species. And that's not always fun to hear about, but really it's important to eradicate those invasive species before you start planting, because otherwise they'll just be a continuous issue, you know, through the years. Another um, big problem we are having now is our increasing deer population in the Grand Rapids area. Um, the deer are just chewing up the native species, pretty much leaving the invasive species alone and giving them the opportunity to keep spreading. And so that along with um, people putting in new native plants and then being discouraged because the deer are eating them. So we're constantly talking to clients about how to protect and cage off their, their species until they're large enough to be able to withstand some browsing um, to the point where they can't, the deer can't pull the plants out of the ground. Um, so that's a big problem around here. Another thing I mentioned to uh, clients is be aware of your overhead utilities, power lines and such, um, when you're determining your larger plants, trees, uh, because there's nothing more discouraging than to plant a tree and then 10 years later, it's grown into the power line and the power company will come through and clean those power lines and they will have to remove your trees. So um, plan accordingly and also make sure you know where your buried utilities are. Um, have those marked before you do any digging. Um, another thing I really stress with people is or ask them about is how much do they like to garden? And some people will just be very honest and say, I don't like to garden very much at all. So that's, then you really have to be careful about what plants you put in because you don't want anything that requires a lot of, you know, maintenance. There's always going to be maintenance with a native garden, but you can choose some plants that maybe are a little less um, picky about what, what's happening. Um, 
one other thing that could apply to our, our plan is um, in the front yard, we've got plantings along the parkway, which is that area between the sidewalk and the street. So if you're in a suburban area and you want to plant that strip, um, you'll need to check into your local uh, regulations as to plant height. Um, because generally we want to keep plants about two feet to two feet to three feet tops uh, just to keep uh, clearance, you know, view paths for pedestrians and backing out of driveways and such. So you'll see on our plan that in the parkway, we put very low ground covers that will spread and be able to take that heat that's in the front. Um, so those yeah. are some things I, I talk about with clients. Yeah, that site analysis um, can really drive your design. And it's really important between a successful and a, you know, a sad looking design a couple of years down the road when there's a branch taken out of your tree because it grew up in the power lines. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely it's things that you want to want to take into account before you actually get the shovel in the ground. Right. Um, it's it's really worth taking time to do the planning before purchasing the plants. Yes. So can you guys then, um, one more thing to talk about with the, the overall design, is there some species you want to call it or the importance, um, how will this landscape change throughout the year? You know, we talked about the difference um, between the winter seasons and the, and the summer seasons for weather. So how does the, how does the plantings change? Well, I think what we're, we see is we put a, large diversity of species in this plant. And it may seem overwhelming to look at, but if you break it up into portions and think about what's happening here, um, we really strive to downsize the amount of lawn. We're assuming there was a lot of lawn here uh, before we took on the plan. And so we are intentionally putting in diverse species um, that will have uh, spring flowers and fall berries and um, provide nectar for the butterflies and hummingbirds and moths that would use them. But then also in turn, will carry berries in the fall uh, for the birds as well. So um, we're looking for a progression of bloom. It's another reason we put in a lot of diverse species. So there's always some kind of progression of bloom through the season. Um, we do not recommend cutting back the plants um, in the fall is a common garden myth that you should cut all your plants back in the fall and tidy up the garden. Um, really, we want to encourage keeping the plants in place. They provide winter structure, winter interest, and the seeds that still are on these um, plants are feeding all kinds of songbirds, bluebirds. Um, I see a lot of uh, um, chickadees and, um, oh, I'm having a blank here, wrens, um, woodpeckers even, woodpeckers, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of what goes on the cone flowers. What, oh, the gold finch. The finches, yeah. yes, that's what I was trying to think. So I see a lot of finches on the cone flowers and black-eyed Susans, so it's, it's just adds life to your garden during the winter. Um, we put in dense plantains and sedges along uh, the lake shore and the bioswale. They, um, they actually offer breeding and feeding areas for uh, frogs and toads and other reptiles. Um, herons, hawks, uh, loons visit and nest on lakeshore areas. So um, the more vegetation you have along a lakeshore, native vegetation, um, the better chances you are of choking out any invasive species that would come in, uh, like purple loosestrife or phragmites. And um, it also helps protect the shoreline from ice damage. So bring in all these different um, species through your plants, that in turn will bring in some of the other species that prey upon them that they need, such as owls and hawks and eagle. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much that our native plants can support. There's so much wildlife. It's more than just 
the monarchs and um, our bumblebees, even though we love to see those in our landscape too, there's, there's, we can continue the, the habitat and the support that our plants by leaving things up over the winter and leaving those seeds available to them. Yeah, our so, gardens can provide a whole education if we take the time to sit and watch what's happening. Yes, definitely. And lots of, lots of free entertainment um, after things get established. Okay, so let's look on um, going forward into some of the, the rain. We talked about a lot of the rain control and keeping it on the ground, on the property where it falls. Um, so can you talk a little bit about harvesting rainwater and how you did that on your site with your, your design? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like we talked about adding some trees and shrubs, um, those will also take and absorb some of the rain um, immediately that falls upon the, the land. But more intensively and, and purposely, you can see the effects of those you know, more frequent rain events um, by what's happening with um, taking advantage of the water that's there and um, with our down, in the downspout areas. We have one corner that we um, have a rain barrel because that space is a little bit tighter. It's at the southwest corner of the house. Um, we wanted that rain barrel to collect and harvest the water, which um, can be used to water at a later time, but there's an overflow where the water goes immediately into, just really spreads into a planting area. Um, to feed the ironwood tree and some lush sedges that we have beneath and a whole and um, golden alexanders um, and some round leaf ragwort. Um, but the water there is really kind of to just kind of really provide and nurture what's what's happening over there, like we talked about before, is trying to feed the friends that are in the soil and increase the um, the health of the soil there. But then in the back of the house, you see the downspout that leads into a bioswale. And bioswales are similar to um, rain gardens. And most people are familiar with rain gardens. Rain gardens are similar to the shape of a puddle that you may see in the ground. It's, it's sort of a shallow depression and it holds the water as kind of gives more of a space for water to be held and then drain into the ground. Um, but a bioswale, um, in contrast, is really um, like swales that are used in the landscape. Most people know about swales. They're used to kind of guide water flowing around a building. But bioswales are fantastic. They're even more special than your typical swale in that we have them filled with, you know, most effectively, native plants. Those can be trees, shrubs, and vegetation like wildflowers, or grasses, um, sedges, rushes, all kinds of vegetation that can be incorporated in there. Um, but in this design, we used even some stones to slow down the rate of the water that's surging out of the downspout and kind of it, basically forcing it to meander through this space, well, we know it wants to go down to the lake. Bioswales are always, you can think of um, as there being a high point and a low point. Um, as I said, they're not like a depression that's catching the, so the water like a bathtub or puddle, but more, we understand that we're following a slope generally, and we're just trying to slow down that water. And then just really what, it, what they are also doing is mimicking what you might see in nature. Um, and with that, we, I know we've talked a lot about sedges, but they're so important and one of the best plant type of plants to use, you know, in our area of Michigan, we have over 140 different native species of sedges and likely wherever people are, um, wherever people live who are watching this, they likely have a lot of native sedges in their area. There are sedges that are good for the sun shade, everything in between, sedges that work in the sandy soil like we've used in the front of the house. You can see some of the sedges that we called out that can tolerate drier conditions. And then also sedges that are perfect for more um, intermittently would be wet and then they would dry out or sedges that really can tolerate almost being submerged. Um, 
So that is something that we really wanted to demonstrate examples of what how you might design these practices in ways that have a legibility to them. They're diverse, but also some fun. And, and you know, we put in some plants in there, like the purple coneflower Amy mentioned. It's so fun to see that goldfinch come and get those seed head, you know, seeds um, that we are lucky that the pollinators came and, and pollinated to begin with. And for people who aren't as familiar with sedges, you know, they're, they're somewhat grass-like looking. There's different shapes and sizes of sedges, but they all produce seeds and many of them are cool season um, plants. And so they provide this early seed source for birds and, um, and they're just beautiful. They're really beautiful. And they, they kind of make, create a nice matrix for the other more showy uh, perennials. And that's a good point, Amy, that, Sedges oftentimes are those cool season grasses that green up early in the season, just perfectly timed for our spring rains, which even before you know, climate change effects um, that we're seeing, we've always had um, wetter springs just because of the spring rain and the snow melt of, some, of winter. Yeah, that's that's great. And that's how you you picked the plants was based on, you know, they're in low lying areas. So that's why we wanted those because they can handle those wetter conditions. So mm -hmm. what happens when we get a drought period and we have, you know, extended period of time where we have maybe higher temperatures or just dryness? Should homeowners worry about that? Should they, you know, get concerned and start putting sprinklers out? How did is there a need for that with native plants? Well, I, I tell people that native plants are extremely tough. You know, I've been growing them and working with them for 20 years and in Michigan alone and California too, but um, they are tough. And generally native plants do require some watering the first maybe two years until the plants really get established and can get down deep enough to start mining their own water. Uh, but generally, they, after that, they're, they're good on just the rainwater. But if we go through periods of extended uh, drought and um, you may see wilting on the native plants, but I think it would have to be ex like arid conditions for a long period of time for those plants to die. They may wilt and die back, but they will re-sprout. They're just geared to do that. Um, another option or another thing I would suggest too is just adding compost to the soils. I mean, like Rebecca said, our soils are very sandy here. Our area used to be underwater eons ago. And so it's almost like, sometimes you see almost like sand, sandbox sand mm -hmm. in open uh, woodland here because it used to be um, underwater. So by um, creating compost, keeping the leaves on your property, other garden waste, and letting that deteriorate and adding that to your either your planting holes or even just using it as a mulch. I think that's the best way to use it. It keeps the soil moist and um, keeps the weeds back a little bit and you're keeping the resources on your property. So no, I don't think that, I think planting natives is your best bet for uh, having a successful garden when times become dry. Yeah. Well, and also may I just point out too that what we are trying to demonstrate as well is that the, the dead leaves and even the roots themselves of these plants as they decay, they are adding to that organic matter that's in the soil and healthy soil is some of the greatest sources of the carbon se sequestration that we have. And so really what we're talking about is trying to build the soil into a healthy condition using these native plants themselves. Yeah, kind of working that whole ecosystem and leaving it, you know, letting nature do its thing and providing us those resources that it always does. Um, all great stuff. Um, so let's dive in a little bit more into the design. Let's look at the front yard here. Um, so can you talk about some of the plants? You, we talked about, you know, like the increasing temperatures and um, having to withstand some higher maybe drought times a year. Um, how have you selected plants for the front to have that? And have you changed your designs? You guys both have decades of experience. Have you changed what species you're planting more so in these drier areas? You know, 
for this project, we did like, and I think Amy mentioned about that hell strip or um, that terrace planting. Um, before moving to Grand Rapids, I was living in Denver, Colorado. And so I really got familiar with the native plants there. Um, they have a wonderful program with their Colorado State University. Um, but xeriscape is a, is a common thing there because of how dry it is. And so you're I'm seeing, even just in the seven years that we've been here, um, just the, how, how people are paying attention to that and not wanting to irrigate um, and rely on artificial means in terms of uh, not relying on nature to water. But that's going to be even more and more prevalent. And the more um, we can see examples of good gardens that are in these conditions, the better. Also, there is going to be a point where we, we're going to need more species that can serve these purposes. And so the more people can get familiar with their native plants, even supporting and especially supporting your local small nursery growers who are growing diversity of species. We're lucky here in Grand Rapids to have Calvin University. Um, some of the leading folks that are taking and studying native plants and propagating them for their own purposes, working with water quality plantings. Um, so we benefit from being in a community where research and um, propagation of native species is happening. And so this is an exciting thing I think for us is that we have so many places where individuals can see examples of what works and keep pushing it because the drought tolerant species are things that we're gonna have much more um, demand for in the future. Um, other ways that we showed in the front yard, um, what some of these sort of drier conditions might be is for the central spot is we put in a little, almost like a very small prairie um, where you see prairie drop seed, one of our native um, grasses, as sort of the dominant plant, as a sort of a matrix of the of the base of the planting, with pale purple coneflower growing up through it, um, prairie phlox, which is a beautiful mm. phlox that has a long bloom time, um, black-eyed susan, butterfly milkweed, and some of the asters. So there's a range of bloom times there, but we wanted to show that you can have these beautiful dry plantings that won't need irrigation after they're established. Um, and then also, I think we talked more about that Southwest corner in the front um, with the ironwood, trying to really show and build a plant community in a narrow space using a tree like ironwood, which is a great urban tolerant tree, medium height and um, it has a deep tap root, so that is going deep into the ground to access moisture that will be there. Um, and then really, we can't say it enough about how important we're, we're really trying to promote soil health and the microbiota that live there and fostering that as part of your ecology too to consider. Yeah. So in the front yard, a lot of people might have little reservation about going fully native. Um, they might want to keep some lawn for appearances to neighbors and, and maybe there's ordinances in their city too. Um, so for if there's height restrictions that someone's running into or a disgruntled neighbor that they maybe want to try mm -hmm. to uh, please but still want to use native plants, do you guys have any recommendations for no mow looking plants that might, you know, be a little bit more traditional landscaping that people might be more appealed to? Well, we we did at Keeps Lawn in the, the plan, but it's basically used as more of a pathway system from the front to the back um, and in curving, nice curving lines. Um, so there's more of a natural feel to it, but um, there are ground covers that could be used in place of grass if you didn't want turf at all and wild strawberry, the um, golden ragwort that we, a round leaf ragwort is a good one. Um, 
Pennsylvania sedge is often used in, in shadier situations. Um, it won't give you this, these ground covers won't give you the same look as grass, but if you planted a mass of them, it would give you that sense of one consistent plant that kind of calms your eye between the other planted beds. Um, uh, and I and I'll take I'll take ownership of putting in a non-native in this planting. Um, and that is, you know, the no-mo mixes that you see out there in the world, that they are not native um, fescue blends, um, but they respond to what is kind of beloved and like it or not, lawns are beloved. And in this context, we felt that there are sometimes the value of having people pay attention to the landscape is worth compromising if, if, if I could say going with some non-native um, is a compromise. In this context, we, we believe that was okay. Um, the, the, the NOMO um, seed blends of these fescue grasses are such that they don't, they're not, they don't need the inputs that traditional bluegrass does. Yeah. Less watering, no fertilizer is necessary. Um, but it also gives a break to some of these gardens that we're hoping neighbors will appreciate. And it's possible that by seeing some um, familiar kind of landscape uh, lawn, they may pay closer attention. Yeah, I think it shows that, that, that it's just not a wild area, that there is intention in the planting there. And then also, of course, adding signage. Wild Ones offers a sign that you can put in your garden explaining what's happening with the native plants. But I think that's really important for front yards. And also, by having native species in your front yard, it gives you the opportunity to be out there working in your garden and chatting with the neighbors that walk by and kind of explaining to them what's happening if they're new to natives and encouraging them to um, try a few and it's a great way to give away some of your volunteer plants because if you have a native garden you always have volunteer plants <laughs> popping up in different areas um, and that's perfect to way to get to know your neighbors offer them some free plants and um, kind of hold their hand as they're getting underway and, and it's just I've seen it several times if one or two per people in a neighborhood add native plants then you start seeing some of those plants showing up in other neighbors along the way. Mm -hmm. So um, that's different things you can do, um, keeping some lawn around your, uh, or a border around your planted beds gives it some framework as well. Yeah, I think once people see wildlife using the landscapes, it kind of triggers them to, to start a little, maybe slowly, but <laughs> triggered to mm -hmm. do something in their yard. So let's move into the backyard. We talked about the front yard. Um, the backyard, we have bioswale is kind of the main component. Are there any other features or any other plant species that you want to point out that are were key into your design of the backyard? Well, we, we use a diversity of plants, like I had mentioned, but we're also looking at creating layers of vegetation. So we're trying to mimic what's happening in nature. So we've got the taller trees with the taller canopy coming down to um, uh, larger um, sedge, uh, shrubs like viburnum and um, chokeberry and then working our way down to lower, um, higher perennials and then lower ground covers. So we've got these layers of vegetation. So that's an important part of a native uh, natural landscape and, and garden. Um, we, Plant, have planted in, in, in kind of drifts or masses of, a, of a one species um, because that provides one, a more intentional look as opposed to putting one or two of uh, one plant in. And, you know, people like to do the, well, it's almost like the specimen um, approach, but we really encourage planting several many if possible, if your budget allows, into a mass because the pollinators are actually able to identify that color from above much more easily when they see a big patch of um, butterfly milkweed, a nice patch of orange, they can zone in on that and um, 
connect, collect, uh, collect the pollen and nectar. So, and the bees will see that too. So you'll see masses of like species in our plan. And I, I think that's the hardest thing for some homeowners to, to try to do. And that's why we encourage people to do small portions of a garden plan at one, at, you know, one at a time. So they can focus some of their budget on filling one area of the plan with these more masses of species. Another area that we have in the back is right immediately next to the deck um, where we have three fragrant sumac and some um, of the juniper below, the kind of the horizontalis, um, juniperus horizontalis, with bearberry or arctostaphylos, um, and some world milkweed, dyschampsia, um, tufted hair grass, and butterfly milkweed. This is a point where it may not be apparent right off the bat, but the bearberry is a slow grower. And it likes more of that acidic, sandy soil there close to un under the deck. Um, but as you meander out towards the, towards the lake, those, those other plants, this collection um, is to be sort of allowed for nature to take over. World milkweed is more of a colony species where it wants to continually grow. And the beautiful seed heads that we see on world milkweed are almost stunning in terms of some of them turn sort of reddish. They're very narrow milkweed seed pods. And that's um, a design intent is to let that be a feature. And we all know that milkweed flies around and it will seed itself where it wants to go. It's kind of like, almost like impromptu jazz where those plants are gonna do what they wanna do. But plants like the Dyschampsia will remain intact um, in sort of the kind of more moist area that's adjacent to that lawn space. But we'll kind of see a little bit of, you know, nature taking its course. And, and, and sometimes you can allow that to happen. We, you know, a lot of times people might look at native plants and think, gosh, their seeds are everywhere. And I've all of a sudden this aster that I put in just the prairie place is all of a sudden all over the front yard. Well, that's up to the um, individual decide, to decide if they want to edit that out. But I hope that that can be kind of something that people take um, as part of their duty in terms of how do they want their gardens to look? And it, with maintenance comes some questions like that. Mm -hmm. In the backyard too is where we um, put a place to actually hide your compost. And we planted shrubs around it intentionally so that it was kind of screened from view, but yet had, you had easy access to uh, putting your leaves there and other organic material that you collect from the garden and letting that decompose so that you can use it to improve the soil or, or use as mulch. So every garden should, should have a composting area. And we use black locust, which for us, it is not one of the kind of more favorable trees, but I've heard from other people elsewhere in the country have said, we sort of seen black locust as one of those species that we're basically watching as climate changes, it's coming and how, how much do we modify what belongs here, or what doesn't. And so that's, the point is we do sometimes still consider black locust as an invasive and it's um, thwarting the, the growth of other valuable native trees. But um, one way to kind of resonate some of that is um, maybe your neighbor had all these black locust trees on their property and they read Doug Tallamy's book and want to plant in some oaks. And so you tell them, hey, we'll take some of your black locust. That's a nice, um, that's a nice, we'll repurpose that in the form of tree cookies, like big, you know, planting or pavers that you can step on or planks. It, um, it's rot resistant, so that'll last for a long time. And just wanted to show that as kind of a talking point of considering, you know, what are some of the resources nearby you, um, mm -hmm. such as that. 
Well, and that brings up the, the um, idea of hardscaping, which hardscaping is basically elements in your landscape that are not plants. Um, so I think every garden is enhanced by having some type of hardscaping, whether it's um, a, a patio or boulders, or in our case, we have a small bridge that crosses the biosoil. Um, because these give you some interest in the winter when the plants aren't really doing their thing. Um, and it also just gives you a more intentional look in, a, a, in your design. Um, and it's functional. You're using, we, everything that was in this plan that's a hardscape is functional, including the fire pit um, near the lake shore where um, people can gather and look out at the lake. But um, most of that whole lake shore is planted in our plan. And we've just left a small section of, of grass up to the lake for people to access the water and to view out. Um, oftentimes, um, lake shore residents want an entire mowed lawn right up to the water for that view of the water, but it really is detrimental to the um, lake shore itself, especially if they're using fertilizers, which go into the lake and add phosphorus and increase growth in lakes. And we're seeing more algae blooms, especially on the east side of our state because of this. So planting along the lake fairly, um, and fairly several feet in from the lake is, is really important uh, too. So you'll see that in our plan. We did not leave um, lawn right up to the lake. That all those plants are really helping to protect the lake shore and providing habitat. And there is much less expensive to put in plants than it is a concrete seawall and um, which isn't, uh, isn't good for the environment at all. Yeah, the stones um, that we see so often, um, that's jeopardizing our, um, some of our greatest mosquito repellent, and that, is, uh, that are the dragonflies. That is nymphs, they live in the water, and then they oftentimes are using sedges or rushes or other um, more grass-like to climb out and then metamorphosize to their dragonfly, um, also known as mosquito hawks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just another another, another little tidbit is is research has shown that if your lake shore is planted, it um, deters geese from coming up onto your property. Mm -hmm. Which we have a, a large Canadian geese population here too, and. They will come in on people's lawns um, along lakes and really create a mess. But by having that planted lakeshore, they don't like to go near that area because it could be hiding a predator. So they tend to avoid planted lakeshores. Yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to keep those geese off. So I think that's a really mm -hmm. good, good comment. Um, so let's move forward and looking at, um, we kind of talked about the prep work and planting, you know, this is the exciting part that everybody gets into. Um, so when we look at selecting the plants, um, we talked a lot about trees and shrubs and how they're important. And if you're going to do something like let's get some trees and shrubs for shading the house and things like that. So we talked, you had an ironwood. Um, what are a couple other of the trees and shrubs that are really important and you really want people to put into the landscape? Well, we've got an oak, of course. Oaks are the best tree. If you have to plant one tree, plant an oak. There's lots of different species, and one is is will work in your area. But you know, if you've read Doug Ptolemy's book, um, Bringing Nature Home, he has done a study on what species of trees support the most Lepidoptera caterpillar butterfly caterpillars, and it's the oak, and they support over 500 different species of caterpillar and we need those caterpillars for the birds to feed on. So mm -hmm. oaks. Dogwoods, we have the flowering dogwood, which that is one tree that may not be um, successful everywhere or even native um, to some of the folks who are um, viewing this, but um, the alternate leaf dogwood is more commonly or wider range of um, where it's native and found. Those are such beneficial trees to have um, for all kinds of reasons, like Amy said about the 
caterpillars. Um, we, we said that the existing tree was a birch tree, another highly valuable plant. Um, the musselwood, the Carpinus carolineana. We wanted to show that um, oftentimes that tree is confused with the ironwood in the, in the front yard so that we, we wanted to put them both in there just so that that was maybe more kind of a learning, you know, an educational piece too to what we were trying to do with this. Amelanker in the front yard, we put those in um, because they are the, the native range of Amelanker is, in my opinion, one of the greatest. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in Seattle for some time and I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, and they've always been native, um, as well as Bearberry, come to think of it, but um, in Colorado too. Um, so we wanted to show a diversity of shrubs and trees. Um, one valuable shrub that we included was the deer villa that you see in the front yard, um, the dwarf bush honeysuckle. That is a fantastic shrub for a foundation or other places because the bloom, that yellow bloom that it has is really favored by pollinators early. And sometimes you're lucky with that shrub, you'll get some beautiful fall color as well. So it kind of resonates with homeowners. As and well it's as tolerant to sun and shade. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. grow as tall as some of the other native shrubs. And, um, and same with the um, New Jersey tea. That's another nice smaller scale shrub that um, has beautiful white flowers on it. And it's, um, it's our native lilac. So when clients <laughs> tell you they want a lilac, you can introduce them to our native lilac. Nice. Yeah, and then we kind of talked about this. People have deer issues. What do you recommend they do to, to save these tender new plants that deer just love to, to find and seem to find quickly? <laughs> I'm glad you asked because a lot of times people just avoid planting things that they think or they've learned are desirable by deer. But in so doing, we're limiting our what we're trying to add back to the landscape if that's all we do. Uh, I do a lot of cages or recommend cages for the shrubs and trees when they're younger um, so that they get kind of that kind of, you know, really head, head start in terms of getting up and above the deer browsing height levels. Um, I know a lot of times with these residential kind of projects, homeowners find it's worth their while to do different kinds of deterrents of sprays or concoctions that they've found. How about you, Amy? It is, it's the same. I mean, there are lists of deer resistant plants, but the deer will eat whatever they feel like eating. And um, I, I really have a hard time believing most of the plants that I, I see are listed as resistant, unless they're a very fragrant plant, like say mountain mint um, or uh, bergamot, um, monarda. They have a very strong fragrance and the deer do tend to leave those alone but evergreens especially around our area are targeted by the deer and so even if you just covered those in the winter um, with burlap a lot of people will just um, wrap burlap around the lower portion of their evergreens to keep the deer from eating um, the evergreens T typically in the summer they tend to leave some of the vegetation alone but in the winter, when they're a little more hungry and there's less green around for them to browse on, they, they'll come to your garden. Uh, but uh, caging, caging is the way to go until the plants are, are larger. Yeah. Yeah. And for bun bunny protection too, you know, bunnies yeah. are big <laughs> and they will <laughs> chew them down too. Mm -hmm. um, what else were we going to say? Yeah, I think that's um, good. So then let's look at our next slide is talking about phasing. So we all have very busy lives. Um, money can sometimes be a little bit of a deterrent if we want to do everything when our, our eyes get a little bit bigger than uh, what we can take on. So how do you recommend people who may start from that turf grass where there's nothing or maybe some bad guys in their landscape? How, how should we phase these things in? Well, we, um, there are, Many different ways, but some of the easier places to start are with an existing planting bed um, and working your way out, whether that be um, preparing that site in the uh, fall with cardboard and bark, you know, some kind of mulch, even leaf mulch or bark mulch, 
um, kind of preparing it for next season to plant that up. Another way to think differently is, as we talked about earlier, those problem spots. Maybe there's a low lying area that's just not draining well. That could be a perfect place to start a new garden. And you sort of start in isolation, that's okay. And then progressively with years, continually kind of radiate from there. Um, and what we love is that We've already talked about native plants providing wonderful seed sources. By using your own plants as your you know, plant source, thinking that through and just utilizing those seeds and planting those right into those grounds, the ground that you've prepared, it's one way to pretty easily continually expand your um, native planting area. Or, you know, you could also plant one tree, you plant one of those valuable native trees and almost like an island as well and plant that with ground cover beneath and just keep radiating out. Ground covers are a great um, great way to cover the, the ground under some trees like maples that cast a lot of shade and sometimes have a lot of surface roots that do not allow lawn to grow under that tree and that's a perfect place to say put in wild ginger that spreads nice mat of native greenery under the, um, on that bare soil um, around the surface roots. And then, um, you know, probably the biggest request I get from clients now is, I want to downsize the lawn, how do I do it? And, you know, our approach is, um, you know, don't use chemicals, um, don't till it up. It's, I really don't agree with any kind of tilling the soil because it, it destroys the soil structure and it just invites those weed seeds that are in the soil to come up and germinate. So um, I recommend just laying cardboard down and um, compost or mulch on top of that. And especially in the fall months, uh, late fall is a great time. If you have an area of, of turf that you want to turn into a native bed, that's perfect time to smother that, that lawn with cardboard and mulch or compost. And then and then by spring, the cardboard has deteriorated and you're ready for planting right away. So it's a, it's a good thing to do in the fall when you're starting to plant a garden, and but it's getting cold and you're not ready to get out there and plant. You can start downsizing it with the smothering method. It's been very successful and it's not expensive. It's not much labor involved and um, definitely easier than running a sod stripper machine. Oh, and just lastly, phasing it, I forgot. We also, one way to think about, um, potentially you're interested in adding a rain garden or bioswale, go out when it's raining and start paying attention to where the water's falling and how it moves around your landscape. And if you are interested in putting in something like a bioswale um, where there's a slope, be sure to put in erosion blanket um, before you plant it up. An erosion blanket that we prefer is the kind that has more of a jute, um, kind of like a twine. Um, it's almost like that, a netting out of jute. Yeah, yeah. it's a, like a netting out of jute that may have coconut fiber core um, within it. And you literally pry these spots open to put your plants in within it. And the mat is stapled into the ground with landscape staples and plant densely. That's one thing that maybe we, hopefully it's our, it's, you're able to see in the planting, but um, plant design is that we're really promoting adding plants quite densely in those shoreline riparian areas. Um, and that's what you'd see in nature. So um, again, it's phasing it. You, you want to know what you're kind of looking towards and what you, what's the goal. And then also by having example landscapes that you can emulate or learn from be inspired by, that's really what we hope that you'll go out and find. And, and do one phase and complete that before moving on to the next, because I think you'll see, if you'll see the results of that one area and you'll start to get to know the plants a little bit better and then move on from that completed area to the next, to the next phase. I can't recommend that more, more strongly. Otherwise, sometimes you can get overwhelmed trying to plant too many areas, better to work slowly. 
Yeah, that's all all great advice and all a great way to to end this and kind of bring it all full circle. There's always ways you can expand things in the future and and learning what works on your property um, by starting small so you're not wasting a lot of your financial resources or your sanity when things aren't working as well as you had hoped. Um, so I just want to thank both of you so much for sharing all of your talent and um, years of expertise and developing this design and everything that you do with your clients in the, the Green Grand Rapids region and, and walking through your design with us. Um, I really appreciate it. Well, I think this is great that Wild Ones is doing another round of designs because I think it's extremely helpful for um, the general public. And there's so much to learn and Wild Ones is a great source to learn from. So if you don't belong to a chapter, hopefully there's one somewhere where you live. If not, consider starting one. Thank you so much. This has been such a joy to work on with Amy and to um, depict how wonderful the Grand Rapids area is. You should sure come and visit us sometime. We've got lots of great native plant gardens all over the city. And more and more native nurseries are starting up. That's great to hear. That's how we're going to get more natives in the landscape is through the nurseries and, and getting rid of invasives that are in the nursery trade. <laughs> um, so Amy and Rebecca's Grand Rapids Lakeshore Design Plant List and their designer notes um, on all um, and plant nursery that are found in their area are all online at nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. And if you have any feedback for us, um, that would be greatly appreciated. We're continuing to improve these webinars that we have. So we appreciate everything that you have as feedback. And there will be a survey that you can take after viewing the program that you can fill out and help us to improve these and keep them going strong. And then we just want to thank you again, Amy and Rebecca, for joining us. And we hope that all of you who are watching this and maybe re-watching it, um, feel inspired and empowered to plant more natives into your community. And we hope that you all have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.